everybody. My name is Aaliyah Wofford. I am a post back at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm really excited to be here. So today I'm going to be talking to you about revisiting early Earth's methanogenic biosphere. So if you were to think about early Earth, you could think of it as like an exoplanet or a laboratory in which you can explore possible ranges of biospheres in which we can see what, what the atmospheric composition of these terrestrial plants would look like. And what we, we also look, about, look at when we think about early Earth is methane. So when you think about methane, you think about methanogenesis, which is one way we can create methane, which in this case, you have microbes that will take in these hydrogen molecules, they will synthesize this methane in their bodies, and eventually they will release it back into the oceans, and it will eventually make its way into those atmospheres. This is called biological methane production, and we can use that biological methane production to, create, um, to look at biosignatures. Another way that we can see methane is that we can use serpentinization or abiotic methane productions, which in this case, oceanic crust minerals such, a, such as olivine and pyrocene are, will react with water, and in that case, you will create serpentine, and as a byproduct of this reaction, you will get hydrogen, methane, and heat. That makes it a low temperature, low pressure exothermic reaction. So the motivation for our work is that we used Dr. Chris Sanson Totten's most recent project, in which what he, he did is he utilized the model to calculate methane fluxes based on oceanic parameters such as ocean crust, res, ocean crust ratios, as well as seafloor spreading, to name a few, and was able to calculate a probability density of fluxes that could be explained by abiotic methane production, which is highlighted here. So as you can see, as you're moving the methane flux, fluxes towards the 10 teramoles per year mark, you can see that your probability is starting to go down. But before that, you can see that your probability density for abiotic methane is pretty high. So you could think of this as your abiotic methane range. And then, of course, when you get to 10 teramoles per year to approximately 15 teramoles per year, you can see that you're, you, there's still a slight chance. It's very small, less than 0.1% of it to actually be justified by abiotic methane production. So this you could think of as your gray area or your plausible methane biolo biological methane production range. And then, of course, after the 15 teramoles per year mark, this is what you would consider your definitive biological methane production range in which where you would most likely see life. <coughs> So as we, move excuse me, as we move forward into flagship missions such as LUVAR, we're going to rely on them to actually give us, uh, be, give us information on how to identify spectral features of exoplanets, <laughs> particularly if we could actually see these spectral differences in biotic atmospheres versus abiotic methane being produced. So in our project, what we did is use this model called ATMOS, which is a 1D photochemical mo climate model. It consists of two, two components. You have the photochemical component, which simulates atmospheric reactions. In our case, we're using Archean Earth. And then we take those reaction, atmospheric reactions and they're sent to, a climate, to the climate component, which basically generates a temperature profile based on those photochemical reactions. And this is an actual run that's being shown in real time, even though the resolution is not very good. <laughs> Another thing that we use is PSG, or the Planetary Spectrum Generator, which basically takes those methane fluxes, and we put them into this PSG, or the Spectrum Generator, in order to give us a spectrum of what these fluxes would look like. And then lastly, we use LUVAR's coronagraph noise model, which in this case, what we did is that it was able to take those methane fluxes and essentially show us what the observer's perspective would look like. So in working order, what we've done is we've given it a flux, we gave it to Atmos, Atmos then printed a mixing ratio, we then plotted our flux versus mixing ratio, and then we were able to give it to PSG, which gave us the spectra, which is here, and then from those fluxes, we, able, we were able to give it to the coronagraph to give us direct imaging of what the actual observer would actually see based on those fluxes. So the bigger question is, how would we spectral appearances change if we were looking at a bi an abiotic methane flux versus a biological methane flux, all right? So if you were to look at this plot, what we did is that we plotted these fluxes in a 1%, 2%, and 5% CO2 atmospheres because that's, we know that CO2, or carbon dioxide, affects how methane builds up in the atmosphere. 
And as you can see, looking at the pink line, which is your 1% CO2 atmosphere, you can see that your methane mixing ratio is getting higher, meaning that you have more methane accumulating in those atmospheres and thus making the methane very detectable. Whereas if you look at your 2% and 5%, which are your blue and your yellow, your green line, excuse me, you can see that you have less methane accumulating, meaning that it's orders of magnitudes lower than your 1% atmosphere, meaning that you will need higher fluxes in those atmospheres in order for the methane to be detectable. So in our parameters, what we did is that we know that you're zero to approximately 10 teramoles based on Josh's paper initially, but approximately zero to 10 teramoles, you could safely say those are your abiotic fluxes. Whereas we also simulate the Earth-like fluxes, which is approximately 10 teramoles per year to approximately 40 teramoles, which would be like your Earth-like body fluxes. And then, of course, we also simulated even greater flux, biological fluxes, because we just frankly don't know what these methane budgets could be for some of those exoplanets. And hopefully they'll have really cool microbes like this. So when we take a look at, ooh, sorry, excuse me. So when we take a look at the 1% CO2 spectra, your blue line is a low methane flux, your yellow line is a medium methane flux, as well as your green line is a high methane flux. And what you're seeing here is that your green line shows that you have very strong absorption features across various wavelengths, showing you that your methane is absorbing a lot, meaning that it's detectable. Whereas if you're looking at your 1%, which is your low, your low methane flux, and your yellow, which is the blue, medium methane flux, you still have strong absorption at different wavelengths, but it's not as strong as you would see in very high methane, methane fluxes. But then when you look at your 2%, as your CO2 is increasing, you see that you still, when you look at your high methane flux, you can see that you have um, the green, you can see that you still have strong absorption at different wavelengths, but not as strong as you would in the 1%. Whereas if you were looking at the blue and the yellow, which is your low and your medium, you can see that your, flexes are, your spectral lines are becoming almost indiscernible. And again, that same behavior is seen in the 5% CO2 atmosphere, where you're still seeing strong absorption of the green, which is the very high methane flux. But when you look at your low and medium, which is the blue and the yellow, once again, you can see that the lines are still becoming very indiscernible. And then here, what we've done, this is our last step, which was where we used Lavoie's chronograph to basically give us direct imaging or the actual process in which the observer would actually see these fluxes. And as you can see that you're still seeing the same spectral features across various wavelengths, but you can also take in combination of signal to noise ratio as well as instrument parameters. So in conclusion, what you've seen here is that you have high CO2 and high methane, which means that you have detectable methane, which means that you actually have the signs of life, which is what we want, methane production rates that are comparable to biology. And then lastly, when you have increasing atmospheric CO2, you know that you decrease the amount of methane that is accumulating in your atmosphere and dust that makes your methane less detectable. And then, of course, that when we start to think about project mi about missions such as Louvre, we know that we can detect that methane across various wavelengths and ver when you have very high methane. So as our future directions are moving forward, what we hope to do is that we're going to change the parent star. So in this case, we are dealing with our Kian sun. We have templates in our model that allow us to, uh, to model MDORs such as AD Leo and Proxima Centauri. And we know that those type, when you change those star stellar types, we know that they can change the spectral features that you're seeing. Another thing that we could also do is that we're looking at changing the planetary distance from the parent star, which in that case, what we do is that we're currently at 1 AU, which is where Earth is currently, and that when you also change those, those distance between the, star, between the star, you know that you can also see different spectral features as well. And then lastly, another long-term goal is that we could actually use an Earth system model known as GINI to actually explore the boundary conditions for what it called for abiotic methane production. And then I'm ready for your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Alina. Um, questions? I think it's on. Whoa. <laughs> Okay, uh, David Kaplan, University of Washington. So um, uh, on the, the paper that Josh Krasans and Taunton did, um, I'm his, I was his advisor. Uh, we also talked about carbon monoxide, and the idea was that uh, on a biological planet, it should get eaten. And so if it's less than about 100 ppm, I mean, it depends on the spectrum of the stars. Eddie Schwiteman has looked at. But is that something else that maybe you could, you could also consider that um, 
because if it's if it's very high, it's a sort of anti-biosignature, mm -hmm. and if it's very low, that's consistent with biology. So there's an additional diagnostic that you can use besides the high methane levels, and so it's just a comment really that that would also be an interesting thing to look at. And uh, thanks very much for your talk, by the way, which was very clear, and very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate having an opportunity to talk to you guys.